Hello, everyone. Welcome to Talking Logistics, where we have conversations with thought leaders and newsmakers in the supply chain logistics industry. And it's my great uh, pleasure to welcome today's program, Jason Craig, who is Manager of Government Affairs at C.H. Robinson. And today we're going to talk about the latest on transportation funding and uh, regulations. Now, this is a topic that there's a lot going on uh, in, in the industry right now and a lot, a lot going on right now. And, uh, you know, as uh, there's no better person to really fill us in on what's happening and what it means than, uh, than Jason, who, you know, it's really his job to follow this and, and interpret it for, for both shippers and carriers. So I'm, I'm very happy to have him uh, on board uh, today as, as my guest. Uh, you know, before we get started, just a reminder that our goal here at Talking Logistics is to make this conversational. So if you do have a, a question or a comment uh, for Jason, you can do so via the uh, submit a question button. And uh, I'll keep an eye on that. And uh, certainly if we've got time and it's a good and, and relevant question, I'll weave it into the, uh, the conversation. And uh, just a reminder, if you are joining us as a guest today, you will have to uh, uh, register first or sign on first in order to be able to ask a question. So with that, Jason, welcome to the program. Great. Thanks for the opportunity, Adrian. I really appreciate it. And as you mentioned, this is a really exciting time. The, uh, the House Ways and Means Committee just passed a uh, short-term fix for the Highway Trust Fund. And this afternoon, the Senate's going to address the same issue. So we're kind of in halftime right now. You know, that's, that, that, that's excellent. I mean, I think, I think they did that knowing that we were having this episode today. So they really wanted to, you know, uh, spice things up for our conversation. Absolutely, absolutely. Uh, so, Jason, before we kind of get into the, the, the topic and talk about the funding and talking about these regulations, um, you know, I always like to ask my guests, you know, to kind of get some context in terms of, you know, your career path, you know, how and why you got involved with supply chain logistics and, and what's your current role and responsibilities there at C.H. Robinson? Yeah, absolutely. So uh, I just wrapped up my 18th year, believe it or not, at C.H. Robinson. I was going to be here a year and see what the transportation industry was like. My, uh, my college major was history and archaeology, but my dad was a uh, career state department. So I grew up all over the world. And I really liked Minnesota when I graduated from college and wanted to stick around and still have my hands in, uh, in international business. So I started off on the, on the global forwarding side of C.H. Robinson, uh, exporting hardwood lumber for a number of customers from northern Minnesota to Asia. Um, then it just, uh, you know, it gets in your blood. And uh, I did a lot of operations for about, oh, I'd say about 12 to 14 years in, in all the different modes, in truckload, and in intermodal, and in air freight, and ocean freight. Dealt with a lot of letters of credit and a lot of hot shipments. And then uh, about five years ago, our customers really started to have more questions about what was going on in DC with uh, rules and regulations. And with my background, uh, with my dad being in the State Department, I grew up in DC. and knew the difference between the Senate side of the, of the hill and the House side of the hill and actually had an internship on Capitol Hill. And uh, I always joked that I was less afraid of the federal government than everybody else at Robinson. So I started to uh, track down some of those answers. And, um, and it became more apparent that, uh, that shippers and brokers, they need to be involved in, uh, in these discussions. Because as transportation evolves, policymakers need to, to understand the story of how that's evolving. We need to engage them. No, that's a great that, that's a great point. I think that this is one of those areas where I, I think uh, uh, most shippers and carriers kind of know that regulation plays an important part in their in in their business in the industry. But yet, you know, they, they get so focused on the day to day uh, of getting product out and getting getting from point A to point B that um, you know sometimes they don't keep as strong a pulse on what's happening there. And and I think it's that's why it's very important. I think to really continue to talk to the community and, and educate the community on what's happening here because it is it does have an impact. Um, so so let's let's get started. Let, let's start on the funding side of things, transportation funding, since you know that, that's a hot topic right now. And, and as you mentioned in, in the op your opening remarks, uh, it's happening today, you know, uh, with the uh, 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 that, the house, I think you said, uh, passing uh, the, the transportation bill. So you know, so let's talk about the Highway Trust Fund, right? Um, and maybe what's, hap what's happened today, you can fill us in on that. Um, you know, but again, the, the Highway Trust Fund, uh, you know, always seems to be uh, running out of money, right? And for people who haven't kind of been following this topic closely, you know, what is the Highway Trust Fund and, and why does it always seem to be going broke? And, you know, why do we always seem to be in this situation? Sure, absolutely. So 
That's a great question. The transportation funding mechanism isn't really well known. So let me try to explain it you know, in a relatively simple process. The, uh, the highway trust fund is funded by the gas and diesel tax and excise taxes for trucks. Um, it's 18.3 cents for, per gallon for gasoline. At the federal level, it's 24.4 cents per gallon of diesel at the federal level. That hasn't been changed since 1993. Um, on the diesel side, there, there aren't as many issues of, um, of efficiency increases like there have been the gains in miles per gallon and, uh, and the, uh, driving, uh, fewer driving miles that the public is having uh, on the gas side. So we're seeing fewer and fewer dollars come in uh, with those taxes. Um, there are three funds that the Highway Trust Fund has within it. Not too many people know this. There's the Highway Fund, there's the Mass Transit Fund, and what's called the Lust Fund, the Leaky Underground Storage Tank Fund, and they're all, all funded by, the, uh, by this revenue stream at the federal level. Now, the Highway Fund is the one that's running out in, in August. The Mass Transit Fund's in a little better shape. The Leaky Underground Storage Tank's in much better shape. So what they've done the last couple years has been transferring money from between those accounts as best they can. And we got a two-year transportation bill uh, in 2012, I guess it was, uh, with uh, significant transfers from the leaky underground storage tank, uh, amongst other things. Now, why is this trust fund important? Why is the federal trust fund important? For the state, they have flexibility to raise money themselves through a state gas tax and diesel tax. And that varies significantly across the states. California is on the high end. Some of the southern states are on the low end. A, a state's uh, funding to build roads and bridges and maintain all their roads can be between somewhere around 60 to 90 percent funded by the, the federal highway fund trust fund. So you can imagine that, let's say you're in, uh, in Minnesota here, I know lots of projects. In Minnesota we've got two seasons, right? Winter and construction season. I know there are a lot of projects that are right now, they're in danger of stopping. Because you can imagine that uh, flow, cash flow is the lifeblood that these projects go on. And the state DOTs, they really appreciate long-term planning and the ability to project their funding streams long-term. Um, so there's this debate uh, of, okay, we're running out of money. This hasn't been changed since 1993. What do we do? Um, and right now, the, uh, as you mentioned, they're, they're discussing this uh, in the Ways and Means Committee in the House and in the Finance Committee in the Senate. They're trying to figure out how to get past uh, the beginning of August uh, to, to find more funds for this highway trust fund so that they don't have to stop these projects uh, that are all going on all across the states. So there's a number of things that, uh, that people have talked about, right? On the diesel side, it's very interesting because uh, what it appears they're going to do short term is, uh, is get through a compromise that gets us to early spring, early summer of next year. So let's say May through June. Um, that's a tactic to, uh, to avoid a vote in the lame duck on the potential uh, raising of gas and diesel taxes. Um, there's a lot of speculation amongst uh, transportation geeks that, you know, hey, lame duck is a great time to raise the gas and diesel tax. Um, I think this debate today is going to settle that and push that, uh, that debate into the spring of what do we do. Because obviously we've got election, an election here. There's a lot of things on the table for a potential lame duck session. Um, it appears that this compromise is going to take that uh, off the table and turn that, push that debate until, uh, until next year. So that's what's going on today. Uh, it's interesting. They're, uh, they're, they're cobbling together a variety of funding sources, uh, one of which is, includes increased, uh, not increased customs fees, but the extension of customs fees from 2023 to 2024. Um, you're willing to bet a lot of folks uh, on this call who deal with international and customs clearance would, uh, would question that a little bit, the diversion of that to, uh, to highways, because I know on that side, my global forwarding friends need, uh, need some help on staffing levels within, uh, within customs. There's also some debate, uh, there's also a proposal to take, do some pension smoothing. It's going to be a little, uh, a little quest, uh, controversial. And, uh, and finally, they do make a transfer from what, I, what I've seen from the, the Lust Fund, the Leaky Underground Storage Tank Fund. So that's what's going on right now. That gets us to, uh, to the broader debate in, in the spring. Yeah, so it, uh, you know, some of the, the, the 
uh, so it seems that, you know, based on your comments is that this is kind of, they're putting in a short term fix yet again, you know, kind of move the debate over to the spring to kind of re, uh, you know, relook at perhaps some longer, you know, term ideas in terms of how to, you know, uh, more sustainably, you know, fix the, the, the transportation funding problem. And, I, and I've seen a whole host of, of ideas, you know, beyond the, you know, the gas tax, um, you know, to, to help fund this. I mean, what, what, you know, such, such as vehicle miles travel and things like that. I mean, what, what are some of the ideas that you've seen or, or are being discussed or could be discussed, I guess, in the spring now, uh, the spring of next year? And what are, what are the pros and cons of each? Yeah, absolutely. There, uh, obviously, there's no easy fix, uh, or else we'd have it passed uh, pretty quickly. Uh, and you're absolutely right. Um, you know, there's, there's a lot of consternation about, uh, about each one of the solutions. So let's, let's review some of them. Um, the first uh, is obviously raising the gas and diesel tax. Uh, what's interesting is most industry groups on the diesel side, on the, on the freight transportation side, have, uh, have endorsed uh, an appropriate raising of the, uh, the diesel tax. Uh, folks like the National Association of Manufacturing, Chamber of Commerce, American Trucking Association, Owner Operator Independent Drivers Association have said, hey, this is a user fee, we get it. If it goes specifically to roads and improving our efficiencies and we don't have to sit in traffic, we'll absorb an appropriate amount. Um, the problem with that is that we share the roads with four wheelers, freight does. Um, and the gas tax is a completely different debate. Even though AAA has supported an increase in gas tax, it's extremely difficult. And even the administration, um, nobody wants to be on record um, to increase the gas tax. What's interesting is that states are starting to do it. You're seeing within the last couple of years, four or five states raise their gas and diesel taxes uh, to make up for some of the shortfall uh, that they've had, including Virginia, which is pretty interesting. Um, so that's the question on gas and diesel tax. That's very unlikely, especially on the gas side, uh, to have a vote to raise that. So what are the options? You mentioned vehicle miles traveled. Uh, many people say that's not ready for prime time yet, right? How are you going to measure it at what point, when? I was having a discussion with a colleague yesterday and said, hey, if it's vehicle miles traveled, would you really like a $600 bill once a year? Because right now you're paying for it incrementally and you really don't see it, right? That's, that's pretty, uh, pretty tough to, uh, to pallet for a lot of, pe a lot of people. Um, there are questions of, okay, do you, do you have some type of technology that, that uh, flexes that tax incrementally at the pump or something like that so that you know, it automatically registers. Well, that's, that's new technology. You've got to roll it out to 330 million people across the U.S. That's a little difficult. So vehicle miles traveled realistically, uh, from what I've, uh, I've heard of the experts, is five to ten years away. Uh, probably the next two or three iterations of, of discussions that we're having on this. Um, the, uh, another proposal has been to expand drilling areas, right? Uh, there's, it's been pretty widely publicized that all the expansion of uh, oil discovery in this country has been on private land. There's a ton of public land that uh, people are clamoring to get at. There's a lot of royalties, but the, the issue there is there's not enough. That was a pretty, uh, pretty promising solution, I guess, about two years ago. Then they went through some of the calculations, and there's not quite enough, uh, enough if that. And again, there's the, the significant um, opposition on the environmental side. Um, other, other options have been to tax uh, oil production further upstream. So let's not tax it at the pump, but let's tax it at the refinery level. Right? Everybody, who's, who's against taxing the oil companies, right? That's the theory. Um, that would have a, uh, again, the question is, is that for, far enough removed from the gas and diesel tax that does increase gas prices um, that you get enough support in the House and the Senate? So the question is, there's no perfect solution. Um, all of them have its, uh, their opponents, all of them have their proponents. Um, my question is, on the diesel side, if there seems to be some unanimity uh, that, that the uh, we're not ready for, uh, we're not suffering from, uh, from a significant increase in uh, efficiency in terms of mileage. The, the diesel tax is doing a pretty decent job. Um, can, we, can we find a solution on the four-wheel side? I think that's, uh, that's the real question. Yeah, and no, I think, um, you know, from what I've seen and read, uh, I, I, I think I agree with everything you said, you know, in terms of, I mean, it seems to me that the current system of the, you know, the gas tax is, is you know, if, if you can get past, 
you know, tax being a four letter word and, uh, you know, the system's already in place. It's well understood. The, 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 the capturing mechanism is already there. Um, and if you were able to, you know, increase it at an appropriate, uh, in an appropriate way, um, I think that's, it seems to me that that's kind of the, the, uh, an easier hurdle to get over perhaps than, you know, some of the technological, uh, challenges that might be associated with vehicle miles traveled, or even just, you know, how do you figure out how do you, you know, bill it, collect it, so on and so forth. But, you know, that that's, that's my thought. But I mean, it seems to me that what usually happens is, you know, what we just saw happen today, that it's just a continuation of just short term fixes, short term fixes. I, I mean, do you for I mean, what do you think? What do you see down the road with, you know, just kind of to wrap up the conversation here on, on the funding? How do you see this rolling out? I mean, will we get ever get to a sustainable long-term solution, do you think? Or are we just going to keep seeing this pattern of short-term fixes, short-term fixes? Yeah, it, it's interesting. You know, I, I do see a little movement for us, like you mentioned, for the, us involved in transportation and involved in this debate, the gas and diesel tax makes, makes a lot of sense. Um, it's a very heavy lift for the folks in rural, rural areas who are driving 40 miles every day to work, right? and for those, uh, rep those people who represent them. Um, what was interesting is I saw an editorial in the Billings Gazette a couple, uh, about five days ago in support of the, the gas and diesel tax. Um, there's a bipartisan proposal in the Senate from Senators Corker and Murphy to increase the, diesel, the gas tax six cents per gallon uh, for two years for a total of 12 cents. Um, Democratic side in the House, uh, Congressman Blumenauer has a proposal to increase it a total of 15 cents per gallon. So you're actually seeing some of these things introduced. I'm seeing the needle move just a little tiny bit towards that. I don't know if it's enough to uh, to break the logjam and come to uh, to some some kind of consensus. So, you know, if I if I had to handicap this race, I'd say yeah, we're in we're in for a couple of short term extensions, but you know, we'll see what happens. Great. So let's let's uh, uh, and again, I I guess you know we'll see this in the papers uh, you know today and tomorrow because this is something that's happening you know right now. So certainly those of you that are listening in. You know, make sure to kind of uh, you know check check the 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 press this week because this is happening right now and unfolding right now. Um, so so let's shift gears now and talk about some of the you know some of the important transportation related regulations that shippers and carriers uh, you know should keep uh, a pulse on. And, and let's start with you know hours of service. You know, which it, it seems to me that we we never get out of this conversation of of hours of service and and particularly that the latest challenge to the 34 hour restart rule. So, so who's challenging this rule now, and and why, and and what's the current state, you know, status of the rule? Yeah, this is a debate that always has twists and turns, and it's uh, hard to keep track of them for sure. Um, so, just to kind of summarize where we've been, uh, July of last year, some new rules kicked in after uh, a year's notice from FMCSA, um, implemented the uh, the infamous one to five a.m. Uh, two time periods within the thirty four hour restart. And also, uh, the 34-hour restart can only be used once a week, and also the 30-minute rest break within the first eight-hour time period. There's quite a bit of opposition to that last fall. Uh, we've seen that opposition continue. Uh, many carriers have seen a decrease in, in productivity per driver. Many drivers, more importantly, have seen a uh, decrease in take-home pay because of this. Um, the question is, uh, it was challenged in court pretty pretty vociferously through by a, co a couple industry associations. That challenge was uh, was resolved and the rule was allowed to stand. Um, so that's done. It's important to note that for the first time in a really long time, this is not important. Um, so that's resolved. Now the issue is does does the Senate or House or uh, President this? Um, in the House, the charge is being led by Representative Hanna to roll this back um, and, and to do some more study. Uh, in the Senate, uh, Senator Collins had an amendment that actually passed out of committee, but then it got bottled up on the floor. Um, and part of it, unfortunately, was, uh, was the news of the uh, Tracy Morgan crash in New Jersey. Um, Senator Booker from New Jersey held up that vote, that bill, from getting any further. So that's suspended right now. Um, what was really interesting is uh, I saw that uh, former 
Administrator Sandberg, and that Sandberg, former Administrator of FMCSA, sent a pretty strongly worded letter to, uh, to leaders in the Senate saying, hey, don't confuse the issue. That Walmart crash with Tracy Morgan would have happened under the old rules. Um, but at the same time, it's very hard uh, for nuances in policy to, uh, to have that distinction, distinguish uh, the details in that level of detail. Hey, would these new hours of service have prevented that crash or not? Just read that uh, that the uh, NTSB has done a part of the um, of the released a part of the crash report, and that, that that driver was going 20 miles over the speed limit. He was also within his hours of service, driving nine hour a little over nine and a half hours uh, consecutively, and within the 14 hour clock, a little over 13 hours. So again. Details are very tough to pin down and get people to focus on. The reality is there was a large truck crash. Um, there's going to be a lot of public outcry on it. Is it going to influence the debate? Absolutely, it has already. We'll see where it goes. The reality is this is a rule that's been in place for a year. Um, pretty tough to rescind a rule that's been in place for, uh, for a year. Uh, we'll see what happens because of a lack of effort. So, so you know, I had read about you know that um, uh, what had passed in the Senate. Uh, I didn't realize that it, it got you know bottled down or, or kind of uh, things didn't move progress from there. So, so just to be clear, the the 34 hour restart rule is still in effect, correct? Absolutely, absolutely. The rules as they were July, you know, they changed July 2013. They're still in place, yeah. and uh, you know that. There's certainly FMCSA is not going to do, not going to make any changes. The question is, does it happen within a legislative body? Uh, and there was a setback there within the Senate, that's for sure. There had been some progress. There was a setback. We'll see what happens. All right. So, so let's assume, and I think you're right. I was, I was going to ask you about the, the Tracy Morgan and, and the Walmart, you know, accident there, and what impact that could have on, on, uh, you know, putting a pause on the 34-hour restart rule. Um, but but let's assume that you know in the weeks and months ahead you know that that issue is revisited and and there is a legislative action to kind of put a pause on the 34 hour restart rule. Uh, I mean, can carriers make the, sh the 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 switch you know quickly? I mean, is this something that would be easily to kind of hit the pause button and, and operate under the former old rules? I'm just wondering what you know, what 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 impact if there was to be some kind of a temporary pause or a one year pause, which I think was the proposal. If that were to take effect, what impact would that have on carriers, and, and how easy would it be to kind of go back to the old rule? No, I I think one, it's a little a uh, little presumptive to to assume that anything is going to happen because it's it's a heavy lift right now. There's no question about it. But uh, you know, to answer your question, I think carriers would be able to make the the switch. It's always a question of what's happening in the broader market in terms of how that impacts the uh, market. Uh, we see time and time again. There's a lot of speculation about rules and regulations, but really the, uh, the broader economic factors uh, often uh, drowned out any clear, uh, clear vision of what that impact was. Uh, yeah. uh, would carriers be able to switch? Yes, absolutely. Would it have an impact on the marketplace? Tell me what's going on in the rest of the marketplace. And I'll let you know. Great, great. Fair enough. Fair enough. So, so let's, let's talk now about another uh, kind of regulations getting a lot of attention, and that's the electronic logging devices. And you know, just last week, the American Trucking Associations called on the uh, FMCSA uh, to quote swiftly issue a mandate for commercial truck drivers to use electronic logging devices to monitor their compliance with hours of service requirements. So, where are we today with with ELD regulations? Yeah, ELDs. We've had to switch our uh... Our acronyms, right? It used to be called EOBRs, Electronic Onboard Recorders, and now they're calling them ELDs. I think that's to get away a little bit from the, uh, from the big brother aspect of Electronic Onboard Recorders, right? Um, so in the last transportation bill, the, the MAP-21, Moving Ahead for Progress, the, there was a mandate to uh, make sure that all carriers, FMCSA, would have to issue a rule that all carriers would have these. Um, a significant issue in this debate has been the issue of driver harassment. FMCSA actually had um, a draft rule for all carriers and a, uh, a rule for chronic offenders already in place. But the issue on driver harassment is pretty interesting. OIDA, the Owner Operator and Independent Drivers Association, made a very strong case that uh, 
drivers could be harassed um, if they voluntarily made an assessment that, he, that you know, hey, they were up the night before and didn't get good sleep and they were sick and maybe they're seven hours into an 11 hour uh, run and they deem themselves a hazard to the highways and take themselves voluntarily off the road early without exhausting their uh, 10 or 11 hours. What, uh, what FMCSA didn't take into account was how to protect drivers from their dispatcher calling them and saying, hey, I know you've got three, uh, three hours left, you're shutting down, you need to drive that three hours and pressuring them into that. Ready to. Um, there was a court, uh, court case that said, FMCSA, you need to throw this rule out and, uh, and start over. Um, and that has absolutely influenced the, the debate. Um, so they issued a new draft rule uh, earlier this year. The comments closed June 26th. So there is no firm, the reason ATA uh, issued that, that, uh, um, that press release is because FMCSA can issue a final rule at any point. It, it could be a month from now, it could be two years from now. Um, I have a feeling it's going to take them some time to, to work through the comments. I'm sure they received quite a number of comments. Some of the issues that they have to work through is obviously that driver harassment issue, um, making sure that those, uh, the, they did put in place some specific language to address that, making sure that that's, uh, that's appropriate and, and enough. Cost is a, is a concern, uh, as well as the issue of automatic uh, recording of the uh, driver duty status. One argument against uh, electronic logging devices is that it's still dependent upon the driver to record their, their status. Um, there's no machine that automatically tells you whether a driver is, uh, is off duty or on duty but resting um, or, uh, or, or driving. Um, so it's very easy to see if the wheels are turning, not so easy to see some of the others. Um, so those are all some issues that are going to be hashed through. The reality is for shippers, uh, Every implementation proposal and proposal within this rule is at least two years to give carriers a chance to, uh, to adopt this technology, to get ready for it, to build it into their business plans. It's still controversial. There's still going to be a, a lot of discussion about this. Um, and we're not looking at it for the next year, that's for sure. Um, it's not going to be implemented for at least two years. We're seeing more and more in the marketplace that uh, carriers, large carriers, have for the most part adopted these. Medium-sized carriers are for the most part adopting them and uh, new trucks are being sold with these so they're slowly working into more of the, more of the marketplace. Um, so that's the status with electronic logging devices. It's uh, slowly being adopted without regulation. Um, the question is will there be a mandate and once there is a mandate, what's that do to the market? Right now is, is this you know, I, I mean, certainly I can see kind of the the impact and the concern and the implications for, for carriers around this. I mean, is this something that shippers should care about too? Or does this have a, an impact or an effect on them? You know, uh, at this point, my recommendation, since it's not anywhere near to being implemented, is keep an eye on it, uh, but don't worry about it. Uh, this isn't, you know, most shippers think in terms of a, a year-long time frame. Uh, some think in terms of longer, but in terms of uh, your, your, your carrier strategy and uh, you know, your bid procurement strategy, whatever you're doing right now is going to hang, uh, hang tight for another year, that's for sure, um, without being influenced by electronic logging devices. So again, keep an eye on this debate, uh, but it's nothing that's gonna, that we're going to see this time next year. Right, right. You know, I've, I've got just a, a few uh, other questions. I just want to remind folks that are joining us live today that if you do have a, a comment or a, qu a question for Jason, uh, now is kind of your time to, uh, you know, submit them as we kind of get through my, my last few questions here. Uh, Jason, you wrote a, a, a great blog post uh, recently where you highlighted several other important regulations and, and one that I wasn't, you know, really aware of was one related to minimum carrier insurance requirements. Uh, you know, tell us a little bit about it and, and what impact it could have for, you know, have on shippers and carriers down the road. Yeah, this is an interesting one. In, uh, in April of this year, FMCSA released a, uh, a report on the financial responsibilities of carriers and brokers in transportation. And, uh, and that report initiated a rulemaking to potentially increase the, the 
It's called the public liability insurance. Uh, widely, it's, it's also referred to as auto liability or general liability insurance. Uh, that level stands at $750,000 right now. It hasn't been changed since 1983, and there are a lot of safety advocates, safety groups who are, are saying it's inadequate right now. Um, obviously, that's a very large debate. Uh, the question is, what kind of impact does it have with the carrier base, especially small carriers? There are a lot of small carriers that say, hey, this is, this is going to put us out of business. A lot of large carriers that are saying, hey, uh, this is something that's far overdue. Uh, it, it just doesn't meet the uh, requirements now. Um, everybody knows that the issue of, uh, of lawsuits and liability is very hot in transportation right now. Because, uh, at, at the, uh, on the margins, the uh, dollars are, are very high, you know, far in excess of $750,000 that you have to deal with. Um, so it's a hot topic. Um, it's something to watch. Um, but again, I think this debate is, gonna, is just starting and it's going to play out over quite a long period of time. So no, no, uh, so no mandate yet, or no, no change yet. It's still kind of in the discussion phase. It's not even in the discussion phase. It's uh, it's raised as an issue phase. Uh, FMCSA has announced that they've uh, they've started a rulemaking on it. They have not issued a, a draft rulemaking, which is really the first part of uh, of any discussion. So. Uh, so I, I guess to, as a way to wrap up, I mean, what other regulations are, are worth keeping an eye on that uh, you know we haven't talked about yet today? So an interesting point is that um, you know with the transportation bill uh, kind of being delayed until next May or uh, June, uh, there's no vehicle for anything to uh, to pass uh, policy-wise. In terms of rulemaking, there are a whole lot of rules that are in the draft phase or in the comment phase. There's nothing that, that it looks like is on the horizon right now. So I describe this as a, as a period of noisy calm. There's, uh, there's, a, there's quite a bit of discussion, as you mentioned, ELDs, uh, carrier insurance. Another big issue that I'm seeing more and more be talked about in the background is detention time. It was interesting that um, the, the president's transportation bill outlined a pretty interesting uh, fix for uh, detention time, which a lot of people uh, recognize as a significant issue in the industry. Um, what they outlined there was that, you know, part of the issue is that drivers are uh, exempt from the Fair Labor Standards Act uh, and paid per mile for the most part. Um, what they proposed is that if drivers uh, are waiting, uh, that they get paid a minimum wage per hour, and that when they're when they're actually driving, they get paid per mile. Um, that would be one potential way to address the issue of detention time. Um, what kind of ripple effects it has throughout the industry, I don't know. But detention time is an issue uh, that reminds all shippers uh, to take a look at their dock practices. It's always good practice to, uh, to get carriers in and out as quickly as you can and be, especially in this type of market, be a, a shipper of choice. Anything where you can make sure that the carrier says, hey, there, try to avoid. Um, the, uh, the other issue that's going to be back in the spring for sure is heavy trucks, increasing truck weights. Um, that's going to be back. One that I'm tracking that I haven't heard a lot about is the, the, the chatter about a national speed limit for heavy trucks. Um, there, there has been uh, a lot of chatter out of uh, NTSB, National Transportation Safety Board, and National Highways that uh, there's a potential speed limit between 65 and 70. And there's going to be a lot of uh, a lot of debate on that, and a lot of opinions both for and against that. Um, people will say, no doubt, that it's a safety issue both ways. That if you restrict uh, if you restrict uh, speeds for heavy trucks and they're going significantly slower, that that's a uh, uh, equal safety risk to, uh, to trucks going too fast. We'll see how that debate plays out. Um, the other one is CSA. Uh, carriers are up in arms about the CSA program. Um, I wouldn't be surprised if we saw something in the next transportation bill addressing CSA somehow, some way. Um, it's a program that uh, I think a lot of people are getting frustrated with. What's it mean? How's it do, uh, how do you deal with it in the marketplace? Um, CSA is another, another, uh, another topic that I'm, I'm, I'm tracking. Uh, you know, potentially, FMCSA could change the screenshots uh, of the basic data. They put a proposal out last 
December, maybe November. Um, we'll see when they change those, uh, what, what it looks like. Uh, does that clear up any confusion about how to use that data? We'll also see if they change any formulas. I did see they issued a, a very welcome ruling from the carrier perspective that if a carrier gets a, a speeding ticket and it gets thrown out in court, finally, within the data queues process, they will take that out, uh, regardless of what the, uh, the state patrol says. That was a significant area of, uh, of debate within the program. As you can imagine, if you get a, you get a ticket tossed in court, uh, and it still shows up on your basic data, uh, believe me, that's a frustrating process, uh, no doubt about it. So it appears that that's been resolved. Um, so those are some of the other things that uh, that I'm tracking, keeping track of right now. Well, I I, I think as you just kind of illustrated there, I mean there is so much going on in this industry. I love the uh, the reference to kind of the noisy calm uh, environment out there because uh, I think as you mentioned in the uh, in your blog post is that you know things in in the rulemaking process. I mean it's a really a long you know, process. I mean, that takes, uh, you know, usually a few years, uh, you know, at a minimum two years to implement and, you know, a year or more to have discussions and so on and so forth. So these are all things that, you know, it's just this ongoing, uh, you know, process that, that doesn't happen overnight, but uh, certainly uh, shippers and carriers need to keep a pulse on to, uh, you know, at the front end, have their voices heard and, you know, at the back end, you know, make sure that they're ready to you know, address whatever changes are, are down the road. So I guess with that, just to ask my last question, um, uh, what actions would you recommend for shippers and carriers to take today to prepare for, you know, appropriately for some of these things that may or may not happen in, in the weeks and months and years ahead? You know, the biggest thing is to, uh, to, to find a, uh, an information stream that, uh, that you can trust and keep track of uh, and slowly monitor. Um, you know, I, I know there are a number of, of folks that do put out blogs, and, uh, and FMCSA actually puts out a uh, rulemaking report uh, every month on the status of their rulemakings. Sometimes it's frustrating because you don't see a whole lot of movement, and sometimes the uh, potential dates are a little optimistic, as we've seen in the past. Uh, but it does give you an idea of what they're talking about from, uh, from a regulated standpoint, what their topics are. Um, so, you know. All the, the major industry uh, uh, trade publications do a great job of, of giving their own spin uh, and, and monitoring the, uh, the things that are going on. In addition, you know, some of the uh, industry trade shows are, are always great places to, to get an update. And they're the place you're most likely to see some of the regulators uh, is at a neutral site at the industry trade shows. So those are also good places to uh, keep updated. Great, Jason. Well, this has been a great uh, uh, a venue as well to kind of get up to speed on, on what's happening, and uh, certainly would uh, welcome to have you back on the program in the in the future to kind of you know touch base again on, on some of these things. Um, so uh, thank you very much again for making time today to participate in this, and I'm sure you're going to have a, a little bit of a busy afternoon now that uh, things are going on on the funding side. You know, keeping track of what else happens there uh, today. That's right. I can. Uh back to the uh, policy wonk stuff right thanks for the thanks for the opportunity I love talking about this stuff and uh, and trying to simplify this for uh, for shippers a little bit because it is if you're not immersed in it it can get exceedingly confusing in terms of the timetables the processes and what's going on so I encourage everybody to reach out uh, if they have any questions uh, please don't hesitate to get in touch with me I'd be glad to help you out Great. Thank you, Jason. You know, we didn't get any uh, questions today live, but if you are watching this episode on demand and you do have a question or a comment for Jason, you can find this episode on TalkingLogistics.com and uh, post your question or comment there. And I'm sure Jason will be happy to respond via that platform. So again, thank you very much for uh, joining us today. Great topic, something that's uh, important and, and uh, that all of us need to keep a pulse on. And I uh, certainly look forward to seeing you all in a future episode of Talking Logistics. Have a great day. Thanks, Adrian.